And we are live. My name is Marcus Davro, also known as the Gen Z guy. Um, and I have such an honorable and excited for this interview. I met Richard recently at an event. I've been following his work for a while, uh, my dad being in the health space and just sharing how amazing he is. Um, so Richard, welcome to the Gen Z 360 show. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, just a, a little bit about your dad. I mean, he's, he's a really iconic figure in the health space. Uh, been watching his career path for many, many years and, and paralleled, it in, paralleled it in some respects, but he's always had that kind of uh, tremendous advantage. So um, tremendous respect for him. Amazing. Well, thank you for being here. Maybe just, how would you describe yourself in three words? And then we'll go into an introduction of, of your career. <laughs> how would I describe myself in three words? Uh, um, I would describe myself as, as ambitious, um, persistent, uh, and I would say compassionate. Um, I feel the pain of others. Uh, with, that's how I describe myself. Amazing. Okay, so yeah, who is Richard Sutton when it comes to performance and resilience and how the hell did you get into that? Where did this passion come from? Were you 15 years old and had an accident or traumatic event or did it just did your love for sport get you into that space or where did it all come from? So, so I came from a very difficult background, as many of us do. I think 50% of us come from pretty hard backgrounds. And in, in these dark times, it, it was quite remarkable because what kept me going and, and that light at the end of the tunnel was, was watching the Springboks or watching Wimbledon finals or, or watching a sporting event and just seeing the extraordinary, just seeing people do something that, that is so remarkable, it's so special. And and just how it uplifted people. And it, it's, it's a world that I always felt I wanted to be part of. I didn't know how I could be part of it, but I always felt very estranged from it. Like it's, it's something that, it's another reality, another universe. And as, as the years passed, I finished school and I was in the generation that had to do national service. So I get um, conscripted to the South African Navy at the time, very tumultuous. Uh, very, very dark period in, in South African history. And I didn't want to go. There, there was no ways of getting out. Absolutely impossible. And certainly tried everything. Uh, arrive at, at basic training. I need to find out that what, what happened with the Defence Force at the time is they've debanded, disbanded all the Special Force units. So we've got all these like highly skilled individuals in one specific domain, uh, combat and 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 taking on the extreme and with nowhere to go. And what they started doing is deploying them into the basic training groups. So I entered basic training. I, I wasn't particularly physically fit. I wasn't mentally strong. I wasn't emotionally okay. It, it was a very, very difficult 18 years. And I, I felt really compromised by it. I was working at night and trying to go to school in the day. It was just a, a very hard combination. And, and I arrived there in a place I didn't want to be. And, and literally day one was the worst day I've ever experienced. I, I can't imagine it getting worse. And, and I was going to be subjected to another year of this or what I perceived to be another year of it. And every day got worse. Every single day got worse. It was more physical, more psychological and, and more emotionally damaging in, in what I perceived to be damaging. And the weeks just escalated. I felt I was incapable. I felt I was unworthy. I, I felt I was not going to be able to get through this. And I kept trying to find excuses of how I can get out. And, and, and basically, I told myself this very negative story. And there was, at about the six-week mark, I was always at the back of the groups. I was always struggling. I was always the guy that was singled out just because I didn't have these capacities, physical, emotional, mental. And what happened, there was, it was a Saturday, the Springboks were playing someone, and the only respite you had in the military was when the Springboks played against someone. There was like everything paused, and it was the only break you ever had. And while everyone was watching the rugby, I started walking around the base. It was based in Soldana, and this, this realization that I couldn't go anywhere. I was locked in. There, there was no way out. Either I had to change and adapt and grow, or I wasn't actually going to survive. I don't know what not surviving meant, but... I wasn't going to get through it. And it was a decision. It was actually a very firm decision. There, there, there are those authorities that say we have no decision. There are, there are those that say you have full decision and discretion of your life. But, but that was the moment when there was this mental shift. And what accompanied the mental shift within a couple of days was just this, I can, I can, I'm, I'm going to, I, 
I've got this. It was like this, this psychological narrative, this dialogue that changed within me. And every Friday we had this, this horrendous obstacle course where we had to do 10 kilometers. There were sand dunes. Uh, there was a whole variety of, of different things that we had to carry, like tractor tires and, and rifles and sandbags. And the whole purpose of this particular event was to destroy you psychologically. And you had an X amount of time to do it or within a certain amount of time. And it was never competitive until this particular Friday where the, the base commander realized that everyone was taking their time so they couldn't get through it. And now all of a sudden the last two teams or three teams would be penalized and have to repeat the obstacle course with additional punishments. So it got everyone motivated. But the thing is that up until this point, I was always the guy at the back, always the guy that couldn't, I can't, it's too hard, it's too difficult. And this, this mental shift really pushed me forward. It pushed me forward, not just emotionally, but physically. I, I became a lot, physically a lot stronger just by shifting my mindset. And what happened was this day, we normally had 10 individuals in the group. We had six and we had to carry the same amounts of things. And we were just thrust into the obstacle course, knowing that we, we could not come second last or last. There, there was a, simply no option. And we tried and we, we gave it our best. And interesting enough, that day, I started kind of pushing myself to the front of the pack as opposed to the back. And instead of being the guy that everyone's trying to motivate, I was the guy motivating everyone. It was this, this paradigm shift. And paradigm shift happened a week or two before in this in this moment on, on the base. And what happened was one of the commanders that was, was watching and, and adjudicating the event decided that a team of six individuals trying so hard needs support and help. And he joined us. And now we've got this, this senior ranked individual motivating us pushing us forward, saying we can. And remarkably, we, we landed up in the top three. The first time that our, our units ever managed to achieve that of a lower number of individuals, and it was pure heart, it was pure guts, it was pure every pure grit. And that was the moment for me. That was the moment where anything is possible. You, you think you can't, but you really can. On paper, that was not possible. It was, it was a mountain that can't be climbed. And from that moment, I realized that there's an empowering one, there's the mental shift that took place, but the real power came from the physical, just being able to do more physically shifted who you were as a person and, and shifted this emotional state in, within me and certainly within others. And that was the moment that I, I wanted to be in this world, this world that I looked up to when I was a kid. And the role that I would play in this world was physical development and physical facilitation and physical strength and physical performance. I was going to help athletes be fitter, stronger, and more capable in their world. And that is where the journey began, actually, in this space. And it evolved and it morphed. And it actually reverted back to the psychological and behavioral set over many years. But, but it's always the set that is so into, interwoven and interconnected. That's amazing. Yeah, I find that there's always that painted purpose story. So that's why I asked, because it's just always interesting to find out where did that stem from. Then you now going into that purpose, which is facilitating and helping high level athletes. So let's jump into the story. I was blown away when you shared it on stage. I really want you to share it to the audience um, of how you met Kevin Anderson at age 12 and then the journey of working with him. So Kevin, Kevin's a, a remarkable individual um, and, and it's been a very big part of my life. And I, I think we have a, a very symbiotic relationship in many respects. And at the time I, we met, I was working with many of our South African Davis Cup um, players and we had a very, very competent team. In 2002, 2003, we had a lot of players in the top 15, either doubles or singles. Wayne Ferreira was our top singles player, but we, we had the squad. And I was very fortunate that I had this, this role, athletic director, and, and I was spending a lot of time and I invest a lot of time in their development and, and it got, uh, got me to travel and got me to see the world and, and really transform my career. But pretty much at the same time, this kid, Kevin Anderson, and his family walk into my office and, and, and they kind of sit down and say, look, we want Kevin to, to be at the top of, of professional tennis and our aspiration is the, this, this Wimbledon. Everyone wants Wimbledon, that final at Wimbledon. And you're kind of a, the conversation is, is very typical because every kid wants the same thing. Every parent wants the same thing for their child in the tennis world. So, you know, you, you, it's hard to take it too seriously and, and really in, invest too heavily in, in these type of statements. But when they, when they started describing and, and discussing their level of commitment and, and Kevin's level of commitment, they, 
they really alluded to the fact that they they kind of put their houses or sell their house and, and whatever it took, they, they were going to take him to the top. And the the level of determination and commitment was was unbelievable. And it, it was a no-brainer for me. I mean, I, I didn't know how good he was and how good, or how good he was, wasn't, but I didn't know that he really struggled with injuries. He was a little bit tall for the sport. He didn't have the, the level of coordination that was needed at the time. He had one or two strengths, but there was a lot of vulnerabilities. And uh, most most coaches and most players recognized he had ability, but they didn't see like that future potential in him. In fact, he had he had a lot of naysay. A lot of people said, "Kevin can't. It's not possible. He's he's not going to make it to the top." And he's doing things differently. His dad's coaching him. He's not in the traditional models and and going according to how we've always done it. And and that criticism and for me for me it was you know I, I generally subscribed to nonconformity and I, I really kind of reveled in in that opportunity. And as the years passed, I'm, I kind of have these parallel portfolios. We, we're working with Kevin to develop him on, on all these different levels, uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, uh, technically, balance on, on everything. And this is full picture. And what, what happens is we've got these five incredibly talented juniors in the Junior Davis Cup development squad. So you've got the next generation sitting on the one side of my portfolio. We've got Kevin sitting on the other side, and we've got the existing generation sitting right in the middle. So, so wanting to, to make a difference and, and really wanting to see Kevin accelerate in his career, I asked the, the junior guys who were un unbelievably talented. I actually can't tell you how good they were. It's, it's remarkable. But I, I asked them, would it be possible just to accelerate Kevin's development just for him to practice with you and just, just have a few hits and get a sense of what he needs to to aspire to they, they were better than him at the time and their response was very negative their the response was very much centered around if he steps on the court we're going to step off the courts um it's he's not as good as us it's it's it will take our level down and it was a categoric no like we're not gonna we're not gonna practice him and there's nothing i could do i was very actually quite resentful at the time and it did affect my relationship going forward but I then went to the senior guys and I, I said to the senior guys, you know, we've got this kid. He, like he's, he's, it's all heart. It's all commitment. It's all persistence. It's all grit. It's all perseverance. This, this guy's amazing. And will you just hit with him, bring him to a couple of camps or squads and, and really just help him in his journey. And the crazy thing about the senior guys is, they said, absolutely, with the greatest of pleasure, we're going down to Margo to practice on this and this day if we want Kevin, uh, Kevin can come with. And, and it was an amazing thing. So uh, I had buy-in from the senior guys, a guy, especially Wesley Moody. He was a very, very special guy, one Wimbledon. And he, he really took him under his wing for this, this period of time. And it, it was great to see. But Kevin's weapon, his, his real gift, was Kevin was all about what can I do today to be better tomorrow? That 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 was Kevin's mantra, and it's the world was saying you can't. Kevin is saying I can if every day I improve, and every single day it was this this recounting of what did I do well today? What can I do better tomorrow? And it was systematic, and it was total targeted and directed focus. And most of us actually don't go into that state. We get distracted and we get pulled in, in different directions and other people's perceptions. And he didn't. He held firm. Now, you fast forward um, a couple of years and I've now taken a job with the Chinese Olympic Federation as athletic director. So I've got this big portfolio in Beijing and I'm, I'm living there. And just watching tennis generally, and I see the senior guys are starting to retire one by one. And there's this expectation that these junior players are going to now fill their shoes and, and fill that void that has been created by their departure. And when I start watching the results, I see that not a single one of those junior players won a match at or beyond challenger levels at a certain level of the game. They were not able to win a match. I don't think any of them went beyond 500 in the world, 1,000 in the world, some, somewhere around that. And, and that in a tennis context is not great. So with all this talent and with all this ability, they were never able to convert it. And there are reasons for, for that, which I won't expound on today. Maybe in the question set, we can talk about why, but there are definitive reasons for that. And now here you've got Kevin. Every single day, his only objective is to be a little bit better than he was yesterday. The only competition that he has is who he was yesterday 
and who he's going to be tomorrow. That's it. That's who he's competing with. And you fast forward to 2018, Kevin Anderson's in the Wimbledon final. Kevin Anderson is five, ranked five in the world. Kevin Anderson is South Africa's most successful tennis player. Everyone writes him off. And this ability to focus his resilience was that X factor that he possessed. And I'll, I'll always like the, the story, Kevin's story in so many, he's got so many positive attributes in, in so many yeah. different domains. Uh, he's, he's a very inspiring figure for me. That's incredible. And I think that principle can be applied to business. I mean, if I think of myself in terms of these long-term goals or if we take it to uh, a corporate space where, you know, we'll sit down with the board, we'll set these objectives um, and you have to apply to all these different stakeholders. But in, instead of working on you as a leader and as your department and your specific clientele and putting that frame into I think powerful. So I think that applies to all contexts of life, whether you're a parent, I know you've got three children, um, so I hope that that's the question you're asking yourself as a dad as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's incredible. And just, I mean, pe if people can see behind Richard, um, his pictures are with, with him, Fedra, and all, Ben, and Serena. Just touching, because you've, I mean, I think it's so rare to have someone South African who's worked at that level. Um, what are the three performance, mental strength, resilience, mindset, habits that you think they possess um, that separates them maybe you can just quickly share one or two of those yeah 100 percent. so it, it's it's a great question that you ask because there's been a lot of research into what separates the serena williams from everyone else what separates maria Shar sharapova from everyone else what separates michael phelps and th there was a tremendous presumption that it's physical they just have greater abilities they have better facilities they might have had better coaching better more money whatever it is this presumption but, but longer feet not off fast that's fact <laughs> <laughs> longer feet yeah he had uh, built-in flippers but but the reality is when you start unpacking their journey their their obstacles their challenges all the setbacks they've endured and you, you, you look at their journey and you look at their competitors at the time the, the reality of, of the matter is that it's not the physical that differentiates them. It's not the fact that they're superior in a certain area or a certain space or a certain domain. What makes them so successful is that they're able to bring about peak performance, the best version of themselves when it counts the most. The example that, yeah. that is phenomenal to use, Andre Pollard. Andre Pollard, the, the higher the pressure, the greater the challenge, the more he's on his shoulders, the better he does. Yeah, same it's with Djokovic. Like, it's a hundred dollar effect. Seriously? Absolutely. So it's same Djokovic. So, when the pressure's on, that's when he comes out where a lot of people fold. Exactly. And and Djokovic, while while you mentioned that, it's it's one of those one of those things that you you know what are the what are the factors? You asked me for three. Self dialogue for me is is probably the most powerful tool, and Djokovic is the master of self dialogue. So you look at so many of his matches. I mean, I've, I've known Novak since 2004 when he wasn't successful. And we spent a lot of time going out. And I spent a lot of time with his team. And, and he evolved into the role. He became a great player. He wasn't born a great player. He evolved. Fedra was gifted. Yeah. Yes, he had to work for it like everyone else. But Fedra was one of those unique players that just had something, something magical about the way he played. And something magical about just everything. But, yeah. but Novak worked for it. And so, so many times throughout his career, you'd be, you'd be sitting there and you'd be in the, the change room waiting to go on after Novak and, and everyone is saying, you know, Novak's two sets to love down, it's done. And, and I would look at generally uh, knowing Novak for all these years, I, I, I'd look at them and I'd smile. This is Novak. <laughs> you, you don't know who you're dealing with. This is Novak. Two sets to yeah. love down means nothing. And we saw that with Tsitsipas in the the uh, Australian, uh, the French Open, where Tsitsipas was on fire, on absolute, like Novak, he didn't have a, a moment to breathe. And what does Novak do? Pauses, starts this dialogue. I mean, no one knows what he, I, I give, I'll give you a sense what he says, but he has this conversation, starts having this conversation, and everyone thinks, you know, it's him being mad at himself. He then goes to the bathroom. He's still having the same conversation. He comes back. He's still talking to himself. And he will invariably, 83.3% of the time, win the match. 
the minute he starts that self dialogue, he wins the match. Yeah, or eighty three point three percent of the match. And the, the greatest showcase of this was the Wimbledon final, two thousand nineteen. Roger Federer at his peak, Novak at his peak. Roger Federer had won, I think, eight Wimbledon uh, titles. Novak had won four, or somewhere I might be one out on either side. And and they go into this titanic battle, and it just no one wants you to make mistakes, and it, it is fierce. Both of them just playing at, at the highest possible level, and th there's no clear ascendancy. It's a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit. It's, it's ebbs and flows. Tennis is very ebbs and flows. And then all of a sudden in that fourth set, Roger just turns turns on the heat, and it, it's everyone said it's done. You know, it's it's Roger, it's Wimbledon, no chance. So what does Novak do at the at the for, on the fourth set uh, changeover? Starts the conversation. Now he started talking to himself, goes to the bathroom, talking to himself, comes back, talking to himself, comes back, saves two match points, wins the match. Two hours later, Wimbledon champion. What got him through? His mind. And everyone asked yeah, him, what do you say? So, so I, you know, I asked the question, you know, if, if things don't go well for you, if you're under pressure and everything you do is not working and you just fail and, and you try hard and you fail again and every, everything you've tried doesn't work, what do you start telling yourself? Maybe I shouldn't be here. I'm an idiot. I could have missed this. It's, it's, it may, I'm not cut out for this. We start this internal narrative of I'm not good enough. I shouldn't be here. I'm an imposter, whatever that narrative is. Everyone has their own dialogue. Now, imagine facing an external threat and an internal threat simultaneously. You've lost. What Novak does in those moments is he pauses and he said, Novak, you've practiced. You've prepared. You, you are ready for this. Just show that composure. Show that conviction. Believe. Novak, believe. Novak, believe. Novak, just this. It's, by the time he, he steps back on the court, he believes. Novak believes he should be the winner. And the crowd will be yeah. chanting, Roger, Roger, Roger. And he, he will be hearing, Novak, Novak, Novak. It's an amazing, amazing skill. That, to me, I, I've, I've been able to use it later in life, um, the self-dialogue. Because so often we get into a situation and we, our confidence is shattered and, and we feel insecure and we feel the self-doubt. And it's just to remind yourself, not of fictional scenarios and things that don't exist, but things that do exist. Remind ourselves yeah. of, of what we are capable of, what we can achieve. So and it's turning an around that bad situation through our self dialogue. So even if there are external factors we can't control, like our boss having a bad day or our clients rejecting a proposal, our own self dialogue can often be more powerful than that and subconsciously affect the opposing person as well. Um, so I think that's 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 amazing. You know, you you say that, and as you said that, I thought you know the the, the other piece. You asked me for three kind of three factors. The other fact is confidence. So yeah. these elite performers, what, what do they have? They're able, what they have is not confidence. So many of them, are, one of my clients was Martina Navratilova. She's, she's won 67 singles, 167 singles titles, 54 grand slams. I mean, she makes everyone else look like they've never played tennis uh, in terms of stats. And she was one of my clients. And before every match, there was this fear that I'm not good enough and I, I can't do this. And, I, I shouldn't be playing tennis. I might be too old. And, and there, there was this tremendous yeah. self-doubt. And we, we assume that because they've been so successful, there's no self-doubt. The difference between them and us, and when I say them, it's, it could be a sportsman, it could be a high form in any domain. The difference between them and us is not the fact that they don't experience self-doubt and a lack of confidence. They do. But they know how to respond in that moment to the extent that it doesn't affect the outcome. So for us, we start yeah. experiencing self-doubt and we start telling ourselves we can't, we shouldn't, we mustn't, we, we're incapable. Maybe it's too high a level, maybe it's too hard, or, or maybe I'm not cut out for this, whatever. It, it then translates into self-dialogue. They shift that immediately. So they feel this, this lack of confidence in the sphere. And the first thing they do is they go back to, in time to when they've been in similar situations and they've succeeded. They Instead of reminding themselves of what a failure they've been in life and in different situations, they remind themselves of the success they've had. So they go back in time and just success. When was I successful? Just remember. Remember that trophy that you held up. Remember that time where you had this, this opposition and you were able to get through the opposition. Remember that time where you are able to shift and change your family's narrative. Remember that time where you are able to close the deal. Remember that time where you, you had this amazing presentation. Remember that time. It's just they start going through this memory flood. 
The second thing, what we don't do, and I, I can underwrite, we don't do this. When we lack confidence, we don't talk about it. We, we're yeah. so busy trying to preserve our image, we don't say a single thing to anyone. So, so what yeah, we do is we, we think it's seen as weakness, and then we exactly. can't get control over it. It doesn't help us anyway. Exactly. It's, a, it's a weakness as we can't change it. It, that, it was so well put. So we, we see this as a vulnerability on our side. So we keep it to ourselves. Are we fine? Everything's good. Everything. No, disaster. These, these guys are amazing. They said, look, Martina Navratilova comes to me just before a match. And she said, look, I'm, I'm really done. I don't think I'm good enough. I, I don't know if I can do this. And she would leverage straight into her support. And what we would start telling is, Martina, are you crazy? You, we believe it. You've done this 167 times. Yeah. Martina, you've won 53 Grand Slams. This will just be number 54 for you. Martina, the crowd loves you. So we start creating, reminding of, she, they leverage on support, and the support starts reminding them of the reality. Because so often self-confidence is a perceived reality. It's not the kind of objective environment that, that we confronted with. And then, yeah. the, and the I think final, one of the most amazing ways, just to quickly add to that, one of the most amazing ways like executives that are watching this right now, or entrepreneurs that can do this, is through coaches. I think that it's so overlooked, especially in this country. Like if you look at the US, the leaders that are leading, you know, public companies, they all have got executive coaches, health coaches, um, psychologists. And I look at a lot of our leaders, some of them have executive coaches, but most of them neglect the value in them. So I think that's why someone like yourself um, is like undervalued in this country and overlooked and these conversations are over, it's all about like the practical strategies or looking at the problem itself but not looking at you know how do we solve those if you mentally fatigued and don't have that resilience just to add to that i think that's there's, there's so much value in that team there's so much value in that there's so much value in leaning into to expert i mean we we look at this this world this this iconic world and this iconic world is big business you're looking at 5.2 billion dollars annually, massive growth, more than any other sector or industry. You, you're also facing or confronted with an environment where it's you either win or you lose. And who remembers who lost? No one. Who gets the endorsements? Who, who gets everything and, and more? It's, the one, it's, it's intolerant. It's cruel. And in order to achieve yeah. and to be successful in that environment, you need a team, an army. So everyone says you, you worked in individual sport for many years. Yes, tennis is an individual sport on the surface. But the reality, if you dive a little bit deeper, every tennis player has five or six individuals who help them bring their fullest potential to life under these high-pressure yeah. situations. So, so we have to kind of put everything in context. And you can't be a successful leader. You can't be a successful business person. You can't be successful in any domain without some sort of external input. And, and it's very difficult for many of us to actually acknowledge that because so, so much of our lives have been self-directed. So much of our lives have been pretty much, our, we are our own mentors, we are our own coaches. If, if we read a little bit more, we'll gain a little bit of knowledge, but there's so many nuances uh, that, that have to be factored in and considered. Amazing. Last two questions. So for the people that are listening, if you've got a burning question for Richard, please can you share in the now? Um, this is an amazing opportunity. He doesn't do a lot of interviews. Um, so please, can you yeah, make sure you guys ask your questions. Just chatting about, let's go to the word Thrive quick. So you wrote an amazing book about Thrive. Um, bestseller for people that have, haven't read the book, definitely go check it out. And now you're doing these consulting and you're doing this coaching and these workshops with corporates. What is, if, if I'm a, a, someone in the corporate environment, I'm running my own and I'm like, Richard, I'm totally overwhelmed. I've tried everything. Well, I believe I've tried everything, breathing and coaching. And, you know, I feel like I can't find momentum and I'm on with my kids and I'm overwhelmed with finances. What do you think is one thing? Um, yeah, I love you, what your subtitle in your book is, uh, Practical Guide. One practical guide or thing that they can do that you feel is mo maybe most changed your life or in terms of your clients that, that you advise to them. So the thing is that one thing happens to be two things. So the one thing that like morphs into the second thing is you have to manage the present. You can't move forward. You can't grow. You can't evolve. You can't manage the complexity that's coming at you unless you can manage the here and the now. And in many respects, there's often stress. 
we can't govern our strength. We can't be strategic about stress management. It's very hard to move forward. And so often within an organizational construct, I get asked the question, like, what's the biggest challenge in the company? Normally, it's cultural. And within the culture, it's normally relationships and communication. Not, and, and that just boils down to your height and level of stress. The second part to that, that, that um, question you asked me, or the extension part, is you have to prepare for the future. So if you want to make a, a fundamental a paradigm shift to your life, manage your stress, the here and the now, and prepare for the future. So the, the stress part, we understand, stress code, stress strategy, their, their ways of, of going about it in, in a very deliberate manner. The future is about resiliency. It's about a set of skills that you have got to impose on your life and that you've got to make them habits. Not, not habits, but certainly behaviors that are part of who you are, your essence. And we can all achieve that. And this is where the fusion of, of stress management and resilience really come into this, this, this full set, this full equation. Yeah. And I think also prevention, right? Because most leaders and people only make change after trauma, only they're out and they're in hospital or only after they get cancer. But what about prevention and, you know, putting those the diet and exercise and the space and um, spend time with family before that happens? So I think that's just another thing that I've, I've learned from you and taken. I think leaders can, can start to facilitate because you can't rely on Richard Sutton to come into your organization and, and force it. And, you know, even I'm sure you know, like most people that listen to your stuff don't ever do anything with it because they haven't made a decision, an internal decision to do anything with it. So you've just told them to do it, but they haven't made a decision inside that says, listen, I'm going to change this. And that often comes because it's not a big prior enough priority, right? It's, you, you're right, and it's very difficult to understand the abstract. It's, the tangible is easy. The tangible is, this didn't go well. It's really having a negative effect on me. I'm going to have to make some changes in life. So the change is imposed on us. And here's the thing about human nature is that humans have an intolerance to change. To the extent yeah. there's a medical condition, in it, like intolerance to uncertainty, and it manifests in all the forms of anxiety from the OCDs to the general anxieties to social anxieties and beyond. So we don't, we don't fundamentally cope well with change. But for us to be the best version of ourselves, we have to change and embrace change. It's like a, a crazy, it's a crazy notion to, to wrap your head around. But when you explore a little bit deeper and you, you say, oh, well, this, this really doesn't make sense. For us to be the best version of ourselves, we have to change quicker. But if we change, we fall apart. How does, how does this whole matrix work? The reality is that the simple distinction between the two is that change that is imposed on us destroys us. So if things didn't go well. We have to react to that scenario with certain measures. That in itself becomes a, a tremendous burden, tremendous work, tremendous stress. When change is initiated by us, all of a sudden it becomes energizing and liberating, and it becomes something that, that perpetuates motivation and inspira creates inspiration in teams and in individuals. So change on our terms, unbelievably growth and expansion facilitating, change imposed on us, destructive. And we, we've got to make that kind of distinction, and we've got to make that decision to, to create the change that we want as opposed to respond to the change that we kind of not so so keen on powerful so last opportunity for everyone to ask a question to richard so if you please put it in the chat and then i'll ask richard but yeah this show is about gen z um i know that one of your biggest priorities now in life is your children um i've got a seven-year-old sister and spent a lot of time with parents coaching them getting asked about where the future is and you know how i get my kid off the computer and where do, what does he study so what do you think, I mean, just observations of your children and then other young adults, um, what do you, what, Gen Z have categorized as one of the most least resilient generations um, currently alive. Um, I think I agree with definitely to a certain extent, um, definitely more so on the agreeable side than on the disagreeable side. Um, I think there's a bunch of factors maybe I'll respond afterwards, but why do you think that is? And like, how do we navigate this as leaders and parents? So it's, I think that that's, that statement was made by Sean Bartlett, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where he, he was struggling in terms of hiring um, Gen Z. He was, he was kind of complaining of, of certain limitations and he would have to vet them 
in a, in a greater capacity. And I'm, I'm making that as an assumption that that's something I read at some point. So, so it's, a, it's an interesting question because Gen Z, in my experience of the different generations, are by far the most socially conscious. Uh, there's a much higher degree of social responsibility. They're also living in a much more chaotic world. You can't compare apples and oranges. When I grew up, the world was was more fixed. Uh, the change was much slower. Now it's literally whatever happened yesterday is a different different reality today. It's a, a world because of the different communication platforms has become far lonelier, and we we make this assumption that communication is verbal. So if we talking and we're sharing our experiences by articulating them, we we interact. And the reality is no. 7% of communication from most studies will, will point to that 7% 7, 7 of communication is verbal. The vast majority is, is body language and its tone and its and its other facets that, that exist. And you see the prevalence of loneliness at, at this point in time, my generation sitting about 50% loneliness and loneliness being the difference between what we want of our relationships and what actually materializes. You're looking at about 79% of Gen Z um, experiencing or complaining of, of loneliness. And it, it seems to be something that's impossible, but that is the, the reality that's unfolding. You also have to, if, if there is questions around resilience, I, I, I would say that the immune system, and, and it's, it's very, you know, if you put it into a chat GBT or you put it into Google, and you, and you ask the question, why would Gen Z be less resilient than other generations? Which I don't believe that's the case. I think it's just a different set of circumstances that they're confronted with and, and challenges. I, I would say that um, the immune system would be a, one of the contributing factors because at the end of the day, resilience is about immune integrity. You look at the pollution we're exposed to in terms of the environment, you look at food, the chemicals in food, you look at what we're eating, you look at the stress that we're exposed to, you look at everything that's changing and it's just triggering, triggering, triggering. And that raised level of immunity then starts to manifest in the brain. It starts activating the little cells in the brain called microglia. And our production of serotonin will diminish and our production or expression of dopamine will decrease and production of another molecule called BDNF starts to decline and, and other molecules that are not so good start to go up and it just this this balance that exists within the brain from a neurochemical or hormonal set just starts to crumble so are we less resilient now because of the environment we're being exposed to on all fronts possibly but i would say that if i were to point to one thing one thing just just one thing why if it is the case and i'm not saying it is the case or isn't the case if it is the case that gen z is a little less resilient than the other generations. My feeling is it relates to perfectionism. If you look, there was a, a very long study, 27 year study involving 41,000 people looking at the different generations and their perceptions of what they expect of themselves, what they believe society expects of them and what they expect of other people. This generation now has the highest degree of expectation than all other generations. You simply wow. don't allow yourself to make a mistake or to look like you made a mistake or any. So, so we now we have this perfectionism and, and we can confront that statement saying, but I want to excel in life and I want to be brilliant and I want to do amazing things. And if I'm not a perfectionist, then how am I going to achieve it? Now, there's a very big distinction between excellence and perfectionism. A massive, massive distinction. And that distinction is that perfectionism perfectionism has zero tolerance for failure. This is not a growth yeah. process, not a learning process. You always have to get it right. Now tell me who on the planet can get it right day in and day out. And if you don't, you beat yourself up. That self-dialogue, self you're not good enough, you're not worthy, you're not, the list goes on. Excellence is a destination. We say, if I work hard enough, if I'm committed, if I'm prepared to grow, prepared to fail, I will achieve excellence. My goal is excellent. I'm prepared to fail along the way. That is a very different, very different paradigm. So I would say just kind of working with these different generations in an organizational context, working with different leaders of different generations as well. The thing that really stands out now is perfectionism. And that, that so is something how do you that how do you help your kids not 
be affected by social media and the fact like what are you going to do practically to, to to try and solve that as the best of you can the answer is i don't know because it's evolving what i do today might be effective for today what i do today is it going to be effective next year or the year after highly doubt it I think one can only instill a compass, a value set. This is what we believe in. This is what we do. This is how we live. And we don't deviate. We do what's right. We don't do what's popular. We live by a, a certain code of conduct and we don't deviate off that code of conduct. And then everything else that fil filters in, if we can hold tight on those values and instill those values for as long as possible, so it becomes the person and everyone around them engages in, in the world with the world in that way, I think we have a better chance of, of navigating a very, very complex and very uncertain and in many respects, scary future. Yeah. From our perspective, quickly, I think all the factors you're, you've mentioned, um, for me, they all point to that it's harder to make hard decisions. So inevitably, my generation, and I'm talking to myself as well, I end up making easier decisions the ones that are least uh, part resistance because I'm isolated, because I have fear of failure, because I'm disconnected to my parents, because et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like a capacity to be resilient. So I'm going to make the easiest decision when it comes to exercise, when it comes to academics, when it comes to my job, when it comes to my relationships. So for me, when I look at a lot of the weaknesses of generation being you know, not exercising, addicted to technology, you know, broken relationships, not wanting to commit to marriage, all of those things are, it's easier. I don't know if you would agree with that. Um, I, 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 we do choose the path of, of least resistance. You, you're 100% right. Um, I, you understand that you're on the ground. You see it um, from a, a close vantage point. Uh, I think that um, it, it is it is in in our makeup to to make life easier. And I guess that's the the role of technology uh, to make things more comfortable and and facilitate the areas that are important to us. I, I think that in the, the decision making um, process, there, there's an, another factor in that we don't want to make the wrong decision. Yeah, it, it's it's you, we we have to we often like. The, the real challenge in life is the fork in the road. Which way do we go? And we can deliberate. The mental energy, the anguish that we go through, it is, it is crazy how, how costly that fork in the road can be. And I think if we live by a, a certain code and a certain set of conduct, and that is that with the decisions that are reversible, make, make, make it quickly and, and make it intuitively. If it's reversible, make it quickly. Don't agonize, just do it. Something that's not reversible, take your time to the last second, take your time. It's not reversible. So, so I think that's, that's, that's an important uh, or a valuable insight on that front. Amazing. And quickly, last one, because I see a bunch of people have joined. 30 seconds to live. What are your last words? 30 seconds to live? Yeah. What are your last <laughs> words to the audience? Uh, uh, anything is possible. Uh, yeah, believe it's it's all possible. Amazing. Thank you so much for everyone for joining. My name is Marco Stavro, known as a Gen Z guy. My email is there. If you're wanting to chat about Gen Z or feature on the show or have any questions, uh, check out Richard Sutton's incredible book called Thrive. Go to thrivesuttonhealth.co.za. Um, support Richard. He's a say icon. I just can't wait for another a hundred years, hopefully of. Um, I've got a huge expectations for, for Richard's health um, and what he's doing. So thank you so much, Richard, for joining the show. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. I'm going to end it now.